I'm Cindy Ng and this is Vantage Point. On this episode, we will be talking about rare earth. Now, rare earth, the topic on rare earth has been intensely debated in Malaysia for over the past year, in large due to the controversy surrounding the rare earth refinery plant in Gaben, Kuantan. So, on February 28th this year, the Academy Sciences of Malaysia had organised an international conference on rare earth in Pahang at the epicentre of the issue. Now, the main objective of this conference is to educate the general public more on rare earth and also to answer some questions backed by scientific research and data. And joining me today to tell us more is the organizing chairman of the conference, Professor Dr. Dr. Zaidi Laiden. Professor is also a Supreme Council member of the Academy Sciences of Malaysia. Thank you, Dr. for coming on the show. Can we just briefly talk a bit about the conference? Because it's the second time ASM has organized this international symposium. The first yes. time was in May last year, I believe. That's right, yes. What were discussed this time around? What, what did you guys talk about? Well, um, first of all, the label was slightly different. The first one, we call it a symposium because that was a collection of academics and people in research and so on. Right. We were really trying to find out more about what we in Malaysia know about rare earths and also get in touch with the international experts to learn about what the world of rare earths was all about. That was the first one last year. Now this time, uh, we call it uh, just an international seminar because our target group this time were actually the men in the street. We looked at the uh, dwellers of Kuantan, right. uh, government officers. Uh, we also, of course, targeted for uh, people in the kampung. And um, we invited uh, chambers of commerce to come. And we were delighted that there are uh, almost uh, well, 300, 400-odd people who turned up, which was a very satisfying number for us because we held it at uh, university, University of Malaysia, Pahang. So, uh, and therefore we also had a lot of students uh, to make up the number. So it was very successful. The issue that's surrounding a rare earth in Malaysia is basically the public's concern over the safety and the environmental risk that yes. the rare earth will pose. That we'll get to that later on in the show, but maybe firstly you could uh, tell us a bit more about rare earth itself. We know that this uh, rare earth is being used in our daily technological products, even like smartphones and uh, mm -hmm. hybrid cars. Mm -hmm. Maybe tell us more about how significant is rare earth moving forward in the future in terms of technological development? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, rare earths are not rare. It's very plentiful. Uh, the problem is extraction and the cost of extraction. There are actually 17 elements. Normally we call it 15, but for purposes of uh, uh, ease of ca uh, classification, uh, most experts agree that there should be 17 elements that are being classified as rare earths. So what we notice is that these elements are useful in so many things, diverse things. For instance, you use this element for additives to fuel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, to reduce uh, pollution, for instance. You also use it for polishing of glasses. Yeah, and, and, but most important, I suppose, it is the use in the flat screen, in the iPhones, iPads, in uh, television, and so on. And uh, the application is so enormous and increasing by the day. Uh, that is why the concern actually is, can the world have enough rare earths? Because the supply, uh, unfortunately, it's at the moment, resource. is very much in China and 90% uh, of the world's, 97% of the world's supply at the moment until Linus comes online, of course, will be from China. And they have recently also cut their exports by yes. almost half. So it, yes. it motivates, I guess, uh, companies everywhere to scramble to find for new places to set up, uh, to find more reserves and to set up a refining refinery plant. Yes. In terms of in Malaysia, what is the, how, how are we in terms of reserves? The exciting thing about Malaysia is that it is well known we have rare earths and we have been exporting rare earths uh, for what, the last 40 years, 30 years. We have been doing this primarily because it is a byproduct of tin mining. Right, okay. So I have been handling uh, Amang, this is the tailings, the tin mining, uh, tailing, which is radioactive, mind you, <laughs> uh, when I was a young boy because my house happened to be close to a tin mine. 
So uh, to Malaysia and Malaysians, tin mining is uh, uh, common and therefore among and rare earth is also common. So in fact, there are already uh, about 20 odd small uh, rare earth refining facilities in Malaysia well before Linus. So, uh, and, and or processing this among Asian rare earths, of course, is, is one of the more uh, topical ones. But um, it is therefore, as I said earlier, not that rare. But in the past, we have been exporting um, much. So, this. this time around, from what I understand, it, it was going, we are going to uh, not only refine it, we are also going to be producing and products, manufacture it. How, how is Linus different compared to the other 20 over smaller refineries that well, you mentioned? First of all, it is the quantity. Because the ore, the ore, the raw materials actually come from Australia, Mount Well. And uh, they have such an enormous amount of good quality, low uh, radiation uh, raw material that uh, they wanted to be processed in Malaysia. So this, I think we are really quite fortunate because not all sources of rare earth have a uh, low uh, level of radiation. And so very much it is the volume that we are using in Malaysia from, this, uh, from uh, Australia. When you mentioned low radioactivity, how yes. low are we talking? Because this is definitely one of the biggest concerns of people opposing yes, to the yes. uh, rare refinery that we have in our backyard. Well, I think uh, it is because of the controversy, uh, previous controversy uh, that we were locked in, which is the Asian rare earths uh, and, and Bukit Merah in Perak. So, uh, very uh, often people are saying these are the two similar plants, mm -hmm. but it is not true because the Asian rare earths uh, use amang, which is a Malaysian product. And uh, that is uh, basically, um, the radiation is something like 40, 50 times much higher than these raw materials that come from Australia. So uh, I think the perception is still that fear that was created uh, in uh, the Asian rare earths uh, controversy. Uh, I, I believe that there was also shrouded in a lot of uh, ignorance because at that point in time, the Asian rare earths, uh, we didn't have, we only had Ministry of Health monitoring. We didn't have AELB, mm -hmm. the Atomic Energy Licensing Board that really focused uh, on anything that is uh, radioactive in that sense now. So because of that, I think uh, this fear also, I understand, rose because of the contractors that was removing the waste from Asian rare earths uh, that people were very frightened about. But when we actually drilled into the problem of Asian rare earths, we discovered that it is perception more than reality. In fact, a lot of people thought that it was closed down by the court. Yes, the High Court closed it down, but the Court of Appeal reopened it. And a lot of people didn't realize that the Court of Appeal actually accepted the manufacturer's view and said that there was no cogent evidence to show that in fact the Asian rare earth was causing this uh, cancer, deformed babies, leukemia and so on. And I can give you further evidence afterwards if you ask me a bit more about this. But uh, the fear that was created because of the demonstrations, but what, 10,000 people demonstrated this, that, and the other, uh, was actually excessive and uh, much, much more than what it really deserved. In a way, I suppose it was also politicized. But on the other hand, uh, perhaps it was we didn't really understand the process of interacting with these activists. Mm. The fear itself, it cannot be ignored because people generally, like we want to build industry, you have to, to involve the people around it, the community. So Precisely. We'll get to that later on after right. the show, after this break, because we want to ask you more a bit about the safety and health concerns that people uh, vary about, especially in regards to the refinery in Gebeng. Mm. We'll go to that after the break. Stay with us.
Hi, we are on the topic of rare earth. Now, the production of rare earth comes with a bit of uh, concerns by people, especially people living around the refinery. That is, firstly, is uh, the environmental impact, mm -hmm. radioactive waste, perhaps, and also people are concerned about the uh, health impact. Professor, you could tell us a bit more about address some of these concerns that people have. Well, uh, the concerns are real, and I think um, we cannot ignore. So this particular conference, the second conference we just held on the 28th of February, focused very, very specifically on safety, on health, on environment, and two other items we included on economics and technology. But we addressed it to people at the level of SPM science, because the previous one was for the expert, the one that we had at the symposium last year. But this time, we thought it was time for us to reach out people who really mattered, that is, people who live within the perimeter of Linus, uh, in order for them to be comfortable and also to share some of the technical knowledge that uh, they can understand and the kind of risks that we are talking about. Let's talk a bit about the fear that they have that maybe perhaps some of this um, material, the waste byproduct of the uh, rare earth could contaminate the water and also the soil. How true is that and what are the risks that we're talking about here? I think uh, the good thing is we are talking about technology that is already proven. It is not a new technology. It is not the first time that it is being done. The first one was actually processed some um, uh, 40 odd years ago. And very fortunately, I had the chance to visit this place. It is in France, uh, at a place called La Rochelle, and the company is called Rodia. They had this processing plant similar in technology as the one that Linus is doing at the moment. So it is not a new technology, it's right. an old technology. And secondly, a lot of people confuse between what is a chemical plant and what is a nuclear plant. They are two vastly different uh, animals, if you like, or things. And uh, when we are talking in uranium uh, waste uh, from a nuclear power plant, it is huge and very, very dangerous. But when we are talking about this Linus, which is a chemical plant, and particularly with the raw material that has such a low level of radiation, uh, we are talking about two completely different things. But unfortunately, Fukushima occurred just very recently, and a lot of people are still thinking that what could happen in Fukushima could also happen in Linus. This is probably the biggest concern about uh, the people that is the environmental sustainability of a plant like that because if it's built, it's going to be there for years mm -hmm. and we measure the cost versus the benefit of having a, mm -hmm. a plant like that. We expect to have a job uh, increasing of our job opportunities mm -hmm. but at the same time, how about the environmental sustainability aspect? You have made a visit to Linus. How, what, are, what, are your, what are your opinion about the plants? Well, uh, first of all, Linus is not by itself. Linus is on a, uh, it is an industrial estate. And more than that, it is specifically for chemical industries. And therefore, when I took uh, the guests, the foreign guests, uh, to visit the place for the first time last year, they were not looking just at Linus plant because they have been to umpteen number of, Linus, uh, of rare earth plants all over the world. They were mesmerized as we went through Geb uh, Gebbing. We found that there was this institute, Latehan, and said, hey, there is a place where you train your skilled staff. They were making notes of this thing, which, you know, I didn't expect. And secondly, when we pass other uh, chemical plants on my right and left and so on, they were making notes of this. So I said, why are you making notes of all this? Said, oh, we didn't realize they have got already this ongoing high pressure, high temperature, complex chemical plants that is already operating. More complex in some way cases than Linus. Now, you're talking about uh, environmental. All these things are also environmental threats. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, then of course they also noted the fact that the water table is high, and uh, this is something that they saw. But at the same time, they were also familiar with the records that there's no serious flooding anywhere in this place for so many years, because this uh, industrial estate has been there for some time. Can you tell us a bit more about the measures, compliance, and to ensure that a plant would be safe to be operated within an area that is um, has 
uh, residential This is area. the question that I myself was uh, grappling with because one thing that a lot of people forget is that we have got institutions that look after this. Previously, during the, area, the era of the Asian rare earths, yes, the Ministry of Health was given the custodianship. But now we have got so many other authorities that are better equipped and that have got trained people in order to look into greater details of all this. The DOE, for instance. They have got people with PhDs, they've got equipment, they've got training, and they've got expertise and experience in order to handle this kind of things you've talked about, whether there's leaching into the water, the groundwater, or uh, to the air pollution with uh, chemicals and so on. Instruments are available, and as I said earlier, it is no longer a new technology. So we can easily benchmark with what we have into what other people have when they have similar kind of industries. Standards are available. We are not starting new standards for many things because, as I said earlier, even the rare earth plant, the Linus plant itself, is not new in terms of concept and technology. And La Rochelle has had it for over 40 years. So we are going into well-trodden territory. We are not starting from scratch. We have got people who are trained, who are able to handle the equipment, handle technology, handle the environmental issues already. This fear that if we are starting the first time, maybe, but we are not starting the first time here. We are actually continuing with what we already have. We have got experience in handling very complex uh, chemical, uh, petrochemical plants in that area. And so these were the points that were made by the experts when they were going in. So by the time they get into liners, they were quite comfortable. One of the reporters asked them, hey, you know, that we have no, uh, what do you call, uh, plant like this before and therefore can these people be, you know, they are Muslim Malaysians. I said we are proud that they were Muslim Malaysians because we forgot that the Malaysians were already running these chemical plants before. Refineries for instance, they are run by chemical engineers and, and like mechanical, electrical engineers, from chemists from Malaysia and Malaysians. So this idea that they have never done it before and therefore they are going to mess it up, it's going to spoil the environment, etc. Uh, it's not true because the health and safety uh, DOSH and so on has got a pretty good track record. People forget that even chemistry <coughs> labs uh, in schools and uh, in universities have to have to comply with safety uh, and health uh, concerns. We're still on the topic of rare earth, and Dato earlier we're talking a bit about the risks and the uh, perhaps some of the uh, potential hazards. But now let's talk a bit about the opportunities of having a rare earth refinery plant in Malaysia, a big mm -hmm. one, in fact, three hundred twenty million dollars. And mm -hmm. what are some of the multiplier effects to the economy that you can foresee soon? Well, the downstream activities. Uh, I think we have not really thoroughly looked at. First, we were talking about. Uh, what we're talking about was the focused uh, look at the processing plan. And this is really, to me, the midstream, if you like, because we're getting the ore from Australia. Right. But there are two dimensions that we have to look at. The upstream. What is the upstream? We are talking about mining. Because when we looked at the map, we, Malaysia has got tin mines, which is linked, of course, also with rare earths. But beyond tin mines, Malaysia also had certain geological uh, heritage, if you like, that promises heavy rare earths. Now, this is an interesting uh, part because at the moment, only China has a similar kind of geological uh, structure that contains and have been supplying the world with heavy rare earths. Now, we are talking about the upstream activities now, meaning we are talking about mining. Mm -hmm. So there is a need for us to actually look into mining once again. Of course, mining has been considered as a uh, sunset industry. And, uh, you know, but people forget that the success of China in rare earth is not rare earth mine by itself, really. You know, by an obo and so on, those kind of places, their first material is for iron. It's an iron smelting thing. And the rare earth was just a byproduct. 
like Amang is a byproduct to tin mining. So uh, we are looking, therefore, at a revival, possibly, of mining uh, as an industry to look into all other mining, not just uh, rare earth, but also gold mine and so on. But that is one part of the upstream opportunity that we're looking at. The downstream opportunity, which is now perhaps more exciting, is the fact that China has now realized that instead of exporting their rare earths uh, at two outside, they might as well have value added in their own country. This is one of the reasons why they are stopping that export. In other words, instead of giving them the raw product, they the finished product. They sell magnets, they sell this, they sell that, and they process it so that people will then buy it off them as a finished product. Yes. Value add, that is one thing that we want in our country too, to Precisely. move towards high income nations. So we talk about to have val value added products, we need high knowledge workers, we need a high knowledge capital and um, high tech uh, industries. Yes. How would this project benefit us in that sense? The visit of these experts when they came to Malaysia, to, to Pahang, they went to visit University of Malaysia Pahang. And they were surprised at the quality of the university as well as the equipment that the university had. And they were further delighted by the fact that we can produce qualified professionals. So as I said earlier, we also had the, down, the, the people in the skilled area. We already have people who are uh, experienced in handling uh, industries. So therefore, they are very comfortable with the fact that, yes, Malaysia is uh, has a future. So potential customers or potential investors will now look upon it holistically that Malaysia has got the people, it has got the resources, human resource, it has got the availability of materials, which a lot of people may not uh, realize it, it has got power, it has got water. Now these are the elements that is required uh, to make a successful uh, way forward vis-a-vis -vis, uh, industry uh, in, in, in Malaysia, industrial uh, development in Malaysia. So when we are looking at uh, the development, we have now got a second uh, industrial park that uh, our Prime Minister has just signed uh, together with the Chinese counterpart. The idea then is that there is an opportunity here to actually have our own downstream manufacturing that covers all these products that I've mentioned earlier on, uh, the sophisticated products. We also have been uh, uh, together with the uh, Chinese uh, University, University mm -hmm. of Peking, where Professor Yan, who was one of our first speakers in the uh, symposium uh, last year, had agreed to become a visiting professor uh, to the University of Malaysia Pahang and had offered two PhD scholarships to Malaysians to want to study, those who want to study uh, in his area uh, at his university. So we can see that there is actually this uh, confidence. And I feel that China, too, may want to look at another uh, place where they can invest uh, outside China, because they have lots of money. <laughs> so does it mean that Malaysia will soon be producing like the next generation of iPhones, hybrid? <laughs> Certainly. In fact, Prius, to me, this maybe. is a huge uh, potential because uh, our labor is now uh, known to be competent and still relatively cheap as compared to the rest of the world. And uh, the availability of port facilities, for instance, is so close uh, to uh, the Gebeng is close to the uh, so you're uh, saying we have all the right port. ingredients, basically. Precisely. All right. Thank you, Dato, for coming on the show. That's all the time that we have. And thank you so much for watching. And if you have any questions or, squ or queries, you can uh, get us on Facebook or Twitter. Or you can email me at cynthia underscore ng at astro.com.my. That's all for this episode of Vantage Point, and we'll see you again next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Thank you.